my previous life had not prepared me for sort of birth or parenting. I was doing something completely different. Um, in labor, I was so heightened, my sense of like not wanting to be touched, except for that, you know, that massage. I was very, very specific about what I needed in that labor. And This is the Birth Agni podcast, the fire that brings us alive, that burns myths and opens a channel of authentic natural birth stories. This show debunks the many myths of the medicalized births, showcases the plethora of choices a pregnant couple can make to embark on their empowered birth journey. I'm Divya Kapoor, a certified birth and lactation counselor and an aspiring traditional birth attendant. Let's get the flames blazing high. In the last five episodes, we discussed the basis of natural birth, the top five ways to approach it. If you haven't yet tuned into it, do listen to the Birth Better series before this. Here on, we begin the birth stories, starting with Namrita's first birth experience at a hospital with an amazingly supportive team. Namrita walks us through the intricate details of her labor and the factors affecting the decisions in her pregnancy. Namrita is a birth and parenting educator, mentor and coach. She is the founder of The Nesting Heart, a mother of two beautiful children born seven years apart in incredibly empowering births. What led to those empowering births, we will see now. Let's begin with a rapid fire round. So we haven't done this before. <laughs> so we'll be doing it with you. Quickly answer whatever comes to your head. And All right. <laughs> so hospital birth or home birth? Home birth. Midwife or OBGYN? Oh, midwife. <laughs> first home birth or first hospital? For me, first home birth, uh, hospital birth, I would say. But I said home, so I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> La- labor or no labor? I'd say labor because there's a purpose to it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> no. Let's now talk about your experience with the first one. Let's begin there. Mm-hmm. And sure. um, yeah, tell us about it. Ah, like where do I begin? So I gave birth about seven and a half years ago now, because that's how old my daughter is. And uh, I had been married for about three, four years at that time. And, you know, it was a planned baby. So kind of went into it saying, okay, now it's time to have a baby, right? So my previous life had not prepared me for sort of birth or parenting. I was doing something completely different. Um, I think somewhere in my second trimester, I started thinking, okay, I should kind of learn about this process a bit. I I don't feel like I know a whole lot. Actually, I knew nothing. Um, you know, and, and hearing from people just around me, just stories, cesarean births kept getting mentioned a lot. So, you know, my mm-hmm. cesarean rates are high. And so it was sort of very much at the back of my mind. I wasn't trying to, I think, change the status quo or anything, but I think it got me thinking, okay, you know, it does seem to be quite rampant. Like, uh, is there something that I might do to not perhaps uh, go through a surgery if I can avoid that? I think that was one of my very, very early thoughts. And I'm trying to think back again. I remember one of my earliest questions was, do I know what labor feels like when it starts? Like, what if I miss it? And yeah. again, now I look back and I remember all these very chaotic movie scenes where it comes upon you so suddenly that, you don't know what's yeah. happening. Yeah. And I think I didn't, that was my fear going in. I said, I don't want to, you know, be so close to giving birth that I'm not at the hospital. And I was in Malaysia at that time. Um, I think I just went on Google and I said, how do I learn about birth? Or kind of took me down this rabbit hole. And I'm so thankful I found this, like this very simple website page on like gentle birth or something it was called at that time, like a gentle birth community group. And I said, oh my gosh, this is new. Like, and they had this big list, like a listing of all these classes that were going on. And uh, they were all hypnobirthing classes. And at that time, I had not heard about that, obviously. And I said, okay, there's someone here, actually, that's going to show me how to do this. You know, that's going to tell me how to do it. So around that time, I had a couple of very 
I say negative experiences with the two OBGYNs I had just seen very early on in the pregnancy. So I was looking to change. Okay. Um, and and would you would you like to like tell us why? What were those signs that you saw that you wanted to change? Sure. Um, I think when we found out I was pregnant, so I did the pregnancy test at home. I felt like I needed someone to confirm this. And I'm like, should I go to a doctor? To... So they tell me what I'm supposed to do. And we had this like little um, little hospital. We went in and um, we were really excited because this was a baby that my husband and I wanted. We planned for this. And one of the earliest things, I don't know if he looked very young. I don't know what it was. But one of his first comments was like, are you planning to keep this baby? And I was like... It's a very odd question yeah. to ask, you know, at the first instance. I mean, perhaps, I mean, maybe that's obviously always a choice that I remember he said, okay, you know, very nonchalant. Like, Fine, let's do an ultrasound. And he said, oh, it's too early. I can't really tell much. You know, it's not, it kind of pulled my energy down and it didn't match kind of where I think I was. And thankfully I picked up on that discomfort and I said okay this person's not the person for me like I don't see myself giving birth under him like he doesn't my husband said okay you know let's find someone else and I, we had actually just moved to Malaysia maybe a couple of years back I wasn't really yeah. well versed in like you know who OBGYNs were because I yeah. wasn't really in the scene at that time so he, my husband said you know let me ask some colleagues that have given birth mm-hmm. we'll take some recommendations and he did ask someone, turns out this doctor was actually very close to us as well. Uh, and he said, oh, this is perfect, you know. I think as first-time parents, we're like, we're so close to the hospital, we can rush there uh, yeah. right away. And now I know again, that's such a, that shouldn't be the criteria at all. But I think at that time, it was the most logical thing for us. We said, oh, we're so close, let's go to this person. And we went and he was very nice. And I said, oh, you know, maybe this is someone that I can... Um, uh, see myself being on a very friendly very chatty you know very uh, relaxed and yeah so he's he's did the scan and he said oh I can't I can't see any any baby here. I can see the ovum but there's no um Hard baby. I to remember. Yeah. Oh, yeah he said you know it could be a blighted ovum so I was like, what? And I, I remember saying, this is unexpected. You know, like, this isn't how kind of this thing. I was quite healthy. And I'm like, you know, uh, I, I was like, it was a bit of a setback. And I said, that's fine. And he said, I'm going to, you know, we have to do a DNC. And he kind of went into that conversation already. So I'll set you up. You know, there's a hospital here that does it. And I was like, whoa, that's that's a bit like, and I said, and that's, that's, okay. that's and- quite an intrusion to speak about DNC right at the start. Right at the start, right. At, I remember sitting in the car after saying, "Oh wow, that was unexpected." And I think I wasn't yet connected. I'll be very honest to the pregnancy as much because it was just so new. And then I said, "No, I just want to wait a bit. Like I don't want to go sign up for this procedure yet." So I didn't call the number he gave me, you know, to yeah, sort of set this up. And that's logical. I said, "I yeah." yeah I said, "No, I I just want to wait." And so. I think he said come back again or we were still like talking so I think I went a week back and I like was on the the bed you know to scan and he said oh there's a heartbeat here there's like a baby I'm like and I was I remember being so mad at him <laughs> in that moment I'm like you were literally going to just you know <laughs> yeah you were in such a rush to to do the next thing and of course that was like super ecstatic news and I was like oh wow this is like amazing like there's a baby there and you know the heartbeat was strong and I mean it was there was essentially no uh, issue at that point when he did the mm-hmm. scan he said everything checks out and it's great but something in my second appointment or some I think we were talking about due dates right so he gave me a due date now that the scan was there he said okay the baby's due around December 3rd or something and I said what happens if she does she's not born and I don't know what made me ask that because mm-hmm. I knew nothing about birth at that time that's a good right? question to said, ask yeah I know and I don't know what possessed me to ask that or maybe i had been just doing a little bit of reading so I said what happens if she doesn't come on that day she he said yeah you know I'll have to do a cesarean like maybe and I remember he said my rule of thumb is like maybe a day or two like that's all I'm willing to wait otherwise we'll check you in for a cesarean because ultimately it's the safety of the baby and the mother that matters Uh, and I listened to that and I think I finished and I said that just somehow doesn't sound right to me and I 
I'm again, I'm so proud looking back. I was so yes. naive. At so that proud time. of you. Yes. So proud of myself because I don't know why that stood out as a red flag to me, uh, you know, to a completely innocent first time mom. Totally clueless now as I look back on it. And I said, that just doesn't seem right. Like, I don't want to be checked in for the cesarean, but because my baby is like two days late. Um, and then that's when around which I had actually started looking for classes. So so when I saw that list of classes, I just picked two people that were a bit close to me and also had classes starting soon. And I got on a call and one of the first things I said was, hey, where with this doctor, like doesn't seem to be checking out. Like, do you have recommendations for someone I can go see that uh, is also aligned with what you're talking about on this website? Because it's all so new and I'm like, I don't know if uh, this person is on the same page. And so she gave me a few and I just made an appointment with one of the first on that list and he turned out to be my OBGYN after that and he was amazing and you know I had a great birth under him but that's how you know that started and um, yeah and it changed I think the course of my birth after that for sure like I think uh, that's so important to be able to find uh, the kind of people who can create that kind of a community for you wherein you have the right kind of a support and that's that's so right right. that's just gets you going Yeah. Absolutely. So when when did you like give birth? Uh, was it over the due date? I that's that's a topic that we want to go to. Yes, for sure. Uh, no, in fact, as a first time mom, I gave birth a week earlier than what my due date was assigned to me. Yeah, exactly. I think a week to the day. So I was at thirty nine weeks uh, on paper. And again, I always take that with a pinch of salt because we don't know how old that baby actually was. But oh. she came at uh, thirty nine weeks. Uh, let, let me just speak about why don't we know about all this? I want uh, the, the, for the listeners to know yeah. why due dates are right. not written in stone. Absolutely. And at that time, I did think that, right, because I was planning around the due date that was assigned to me. And funnily enough, on that note, because I had changed my doctor three times, I actually was given a different due date every time, to be honest. So it always varied between like December 3rd to 5th. So it wasn't even set in stone by them either. So and why aren't they definitive? Because I think if you see how they're calculated based on the date of our, our last period before we find out we're pregnant, None of us have those perfect 28-day cycles, first of all. They vary a lot. And um, if we understand, again, the whole conception process, when we make love and there's fertilization, it usually happens a few days after the period. It's not on the day. So already we have a few days uh, later that kind of needs to be taken into account. So if you're really calculating the birth, the, the, the age of the, the fetus or the baby inside, it doesn't start at the at the from the start of your period it starts from when it's actually fertilized which already adds a few days on and then of course fertilization varies as well for a lot of us we can't really pinpoint exactly when that happens and when it gets attached to the so there's so much nuance in the process and i understand why we have due dates that they give us a nice reliable estimate to kind of say okay am i having a baby in december or but i think it also needs to be taken with that amount of space where we're not fixating and making an X on the calendar and saying that's yes. the date because that final finality of this is when my baby is going to be born because sure. there's no way to say that. Yes, we definitely say that the baby decides when it wants to be uh, born mm-hmm. and the baby kind of creates that um, surge of hormones that drive your labor and put you into labor. So it's the baby's mm-hmm. decision and the lungs are, uh, lungs of the brain are the last ones to kind of mature. and True. It's such a nuanced process, like why interfere with that when there's no reason to? There are sometimes, you know, valid reasons, but in the absence of one, like how do we know what we're disrupting in its development? And I always think, at least personally for my children, that I want to give them the fullest chance to completely develop before they enter the world, because who knows what I'm interrupting if I go in there and try to play God and say, I know when this baby needs to be born. And I think that's a bit, um, yeah. So to me, that was really important. And I'm very grateful that I was given that space to, you know, really go into labor spontaneously because I was doing well. The baby was doing well. You know, um, she was healthy. So, um, yeah. And that's how I went into labor 39 weeks. Unexpectedly, I would say, because I wasn't as prepared as I should have been. Um, 
And how did it yeah. feel like? How did the first contractions feel like? Ah, so I have another uh, exception to the norm here. I didn't have contractions first. Actually, my membranes released first or, you know, like oh. my waters broke first. Yeah. You know, of course, my husband was next to me I was sleeping and I suddenly woke up at about uh, 4.30 or 5 a.m. in the morning with like something leaking out of me. And I said, I said, like, okay, let me just go to the toilet and use the toilet. And I started noticing the the leaking side and I knew by then of course because I'd done the birth classes etc to be that's to be expected and I called out to my husband because he was still asleep and we had actually had a bit of a late night the previous night I think we were like sorting stuff or something mm. so he mm. didn't get to bed early so he was actually quite tired out mm. I called out to him and I said oh I think my you know my waters have released like and he said are you sure you didn't pee yourself and I said no <laughs> I know <laughs> it's not that and so we had a bit of a laugh and I said, oh, wow. And I remember feeling this like sense of excitement. It was still very dark and my husband was still in bed. Um, so the day hadn't started yet, but I just had this like very tingly sense of, oh, it's today. Like this is when I'm going to. This is meet. happening. Yeah, this is yeah. happening. I'm going to see my daughter soon. Um, so again, I just had that feeling of what do I do next? now what happens because there isn't that much drama around labor mm. right it's not like I had to do something because I still didn't have those contractions it was just very early on mm. uh, and so I did the thing of checking the fluid it was clear there's no blood there was nothing in there so put on a pad and said okay kind of let's see what to do next but I did feel like again because it was a bit early my bag had not been fully packed like I put mm. some stuff aside and I didn't have that packed hospital bag rookie mistake because <laughs> like you should have your own bag back but 38 weeks so I was like okay let me put everything together because we'll be leaving you know soonish to the hospital uh, I was very relaxed and I think when it was about 8 a.m or something when the hospital would open I did call the nurses and say hey this is what's happened so they did say oh you, do you want to come in and I said maybe I'll just kind of wait it out but I think that question did give me a sense of should I like why did they ask that despite knowing you know I said yeah I mean I will eventually come in but I didn't want to go in just yet because I had no contractions I think at, at that point um so we started getting stuff ready and just a little bit of a side story, I think that in, influenced a lot of our decisions on that day was that our car was given for servicing because it had had an issue a couple of days before. And my husband's like, I'm going to get it fixed right now. So next week, you know, we have a car when you go into labor. And so ironic that when I did go into labor, we didn't have the car with us. And it's so good luck. <laughs> I know I, it's funny how those things happen. And so I did have you know, that in the back of my mind of like, when do we go in? Because our mm. hospital was about a 30 minute drive. And in Malaysia, that's pretty normal. Like, you know, it's uh, it, so we did make the decision at that time to say, OK, should we just go to the hospital? Because my contractions did start at that point. So by around eight ish, I was starting to feel these very relaxed, very manageable, but quite uh, patterned contractions. So I was getting them maybe about every 20 minutes or so. Yeah. So and how did they feel like, like, what was, I, I felt them on my back. So just like coming and going, uh, very, um, very relaxed. I felt like they, I could feel them. So there was something changing, but it didn't stop me from what I was doing because I was still packing my bags. So kind of, so we did make that decision, I think, to call a cab because at that time we didn't have those apps as well. <laughs> that you, <laughs> yeah, now I think how, how ancient I sound, right? We didn't have those apps. But I remember I had this big birth ball and I had these pillows and I was standing there to be picked up. <laughs> Taxi driver gave me a really strange look. He's like, because I was very heavily pregnant, right? I was at almost at 40 weeks and this big belly and this birth ball. And he looked at me like, are you, are you going to have a baby? <laughs> I'm like, yeah. Um, uh, very, I mean, like I said, I was having the contractions, but not nothing crazy happening. So we, um, we continued, you know, in the hospital. I was having the contractions, I was timing them, you know, every 20 minutes. I, I remember thinking, uh, uh, you know, the, from my classes about like walking into the labor ward and not being wheeled in, in, the, in the wheelchair. 
uh, because I know that's very customary. I think to be offered yeah, that at the at the yeah. door. We walked into the labor ward, went in, checked in, said, "Hey, I'm in labor. I think you know, maybe having my baby soon because I'm feeling the things." And they said, "Okay, you know, uh, I had uh, chosen for a water birth suite at that time, so they had two that had the water birth facility. So they said, "Oh, it's available. So do you want to go directly into that?" And I, I think again. Um, now I look back at how long drawn out it is because it isn't there's no drama because there's nothing happening to do this is very very relaxed they're like okay just go in there you know we'll come by and check you because we do need to do that sort of uh, triage like just get all our baseline uh, levels for everything so they said just get comfortable yeah so I was in my street clothes right I was wearing jeans and a top or something like that and I went in just sat on the bed and I said okay <laughs> wait um, and I, I have pictures of me like I actually brought my laptop along because at that time I was uh, I was a PhD student at the university and I had some papers to submit like I wanted to send some work out before I gave birth and and I always give this example of how relaxed the early labor was because I mean they were coming and going but I was like I need to get this done and I told my uh, professor I said okay like sending these emails out so that you know we have this so for the first couple of hours I think I was actually that's what I was doing to get things out of the way. I don't recommend that because again it takes away from being present but I think I was trying to multitask at that time later and how many hours was it before the active labor kind of started and then how did that feel oh it was uh, it was a long time i my active labor started at 6 that evening so uh, basically we checked in i would say around 10 a.m that day uh, it was a bit early i would still say like i think mm. we went in too early but uh, yeah. we were there from the hospital from 10 to 6 essentially hanging out because there was nothing to do <laughs> um contractions at that time and they obviously asked me you know how far apart they are and i said yeah about 20 20 to 15 minutes i think at that time and they said oh yeah you know i mean of course that puts everyone at ease i think because everyone knows and there was a point where my doctor did come in to check i think once during that morning and uh once he's he did that he looked at me he spoke and there was the offer made to me they said do you want to just go back home like it's it's quite early and my husband and i like think we took a minute to kind of consider that and we said maybe we'll just stay on because we don't have the car i didn't want to again bundle up into the taxi mm-hmm. and let's say you know i suddenly go into active labor i didn't want to do the whole process again so i said and and i felt really comfortable i think that was the thing because i was really given a lot of space to just b you know there wasn't really much happening the nurses would come and check uh, every so often but beyond that it felt very nice so i don't think uh, i felt like i had to go back and so i said no we'll just kind of stay on and see what happens and interestingly so this is something i tell in all my birth classes as well because it's a classic example so after lunch uh, i think by then they maybe built up to perhaps you know like 10 12 minutes so it was moving forward there was a narrowing of the gap between contractions it wasn't like it was stuck at 20 it was kind of getting to 12 and i said oh yeah like eight yes and then <laughs> we had lunch and i think around perhaps 2 or 3 o'clock um they completely stopped completely stopped it was like i had no contractions and i was like what is going on and again as a first time mom i mean i i did do the classes but i didn't know everything about birth i just yeah. there was no way for me to It understand or compare right yeah. and i there was a moment where i thought was this like you know what they call false labor or the prax like was it not even labor like am i having a baby today like what's going on i said maybe you know my body's changed its mind and i thought Uh, there was a point where I thought maybe this was just sort of something building up to it and it wasn't that maybe I was too premature in my uh, excitement that today was the day. And now in hindsight, I give so much credit to the hospital because there was not once in that time where there was like, should we do something? You know, essentially when they stopped, I think I the nurses might have come and popped their head in and I said, I'm not feeling anything really. And they said, okay, kind of like, okay and so we just hung out I love you know now we had no contraction we were in a hospital suite <laughs> and and so um i have really good memories of that time because um we had told my my cousins like we had a whatsapp group and this was my mom's side of the family so we were really close with all the cousins and i remember when i said that the 
the energy that I felt like they were so pumped up, but not in a anxious, like what's mm. happening kind of way, but like, yes, it's time. And I remember being just so excited about that update and kind of feeding off of the energy because it just made me feel really um, ready. That's all we were doing. Right. And then it was afternoon, no labor yet. And around six o'clock, I was trying to be very planned because my doctor did pop in again and say, maybe, you know, it's going to pick up in the night. Let's let's see what's happening, because I think he was at the end of his day and he went away. So around six o'clock, I said, I want to be really planned because I anticipate this to be a night labor, you know, and um, let's go down and have dinner because I'm bored of sitting in the hospital room. And that hospital at that time, they had this like food court downstairs that like all these options to eat. I have I have an urge to ask you this question. Yes, Uh, (laughs) please. (laughs) So kind of before that, when, you know, everything was very manageable, did you have a feeling it's going to be like that throughout or it's going to be very manageable? I'm going to just get it done. Yes. Yes, I did. And that was a great question. I think I didn't, I don't think at that time I was really expecting or I was planning ahead. I I don't think I was thinking, oh, you know, this is what I was told. Look at this. I'm I'm like doing great. You know, Mm -hmm. it's relaxed so far. And even when I, right now, when I said, oh, it's going to ramp up later on, I don't think I had an idea that time, like what that meant or how intense or what that could uh, feel like. So no, that that's a great question because I never reflected on that. And do you think it's a good thing? Uh, to me, I think it's a good thing to think that, oh, it's manageable. Oh, I can do it. Yeah, oh, it's yeah. Just going absolutely. To- it is. It is. And it's, I think in both ways, I think perhaps on the day, the mindset I was in was actually just nice at that time because you know it allowed me to be really very relaxed and I also I think uh, fed off of the energy of the staff around me and that's why I said it's so important because there was no rushing and I know myself if someone had popped in and said "Mm, I don't know why you're not yet in labor like it's been you know four hours like there's no contraction I think I would have worried and said what's wrong like why is this not you know going ahead and I gave them full credit like both to my doctor and that they were just like yeah let's let's see what's going on you know Uh, and and also to mention here I was someone with my waters uh, released like my membranes had released so they were still very relaxed about uh, that as well I mean not to say they weren't monitoring or they weren't on top of things but they weren't there wasn't that sort of rushed sense of and were you on antibiotics like um, were you given ins- I was an antibiotic so there was a discussion about that as well um, that's a great question so um, when I was about 36 weeks pregnant in Malaysia it's uh, a routine to do a group B strep swab so mm-hmm. they uh, check you for a group B strep and I was positive so that is when the actually the, okay. the topic about antibiotics have come up and I uh, Uh, By then, because I had a birth plan and I was, you know, doing all this reading, I said, what does that mean? So he said, you know, we need to put you on continuous antibiotics because you're on, on, you know, you have group B strep. And I said, oh my gosh, that means I can't move because I'm hooked up. And I wouldn't have done this otherwise, but because I had done all the asking for options and there's always alternatives, I said, is there another way that I can manage this? Because I want to move and I understand that, you know, you have, as I said, how can I still move? Like, you know, that's important to me. I get that you have to do this. Like, is there something you can do to do that? So he said, mm, well, I can, you know, change the dosage in a way where it's not continuous and um, uh, something that can be put in and taken out, like given three times so that you have to uh, have it administered and then you can be free off of it. Like I can remove that, you can move and then eight hours later, you get that again, if I'm remembering the thing right. But but that was so important. And I think that was such a small win because I because I asked him for that option, he gave it to me. Otherwise, his way of doing it would have just been, you know, let's just hook you up because that's what I do. That's, you know, then you're sitting with the IV. So they gave me one as when I had gone in. Uh, eventually, the second month came much later on. So I was really free to move in between. I was not constrained in any way. And that influences your labors in, in a good way. That you want, yeah. So it's so important. Absolutely, yeah. Because I again, I was free to move, and that's what I was getting. At so at six o'clock, I was able to go down because I was kind of, you know, had read somewhere again, just get a change of scene. Like sometimes that helps, you know, when yeah, you're not because yeah. you know, we had been in the room for a long time, and there's only so much I could do. So I told my husband, I said, "Hey, let's go down and get something to eat, get that out of the way, so that you know, if labor were to pick up later, I've I'm 
somewhat fueled. I have, you know, some food inside me. I'm not totally um, hungry and starving. And so we went down and <laughs> this is a, there was a subway there and it's always my go-to because I was like, oh, this sandwich is light. It's, you That's know, just it's, my husband's it's, thing. It's, 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 I know. Subway. <laughs> but <laughs> what I'm going to say next is not a good story <laughs> because I ordered my regular, you know, and my husband went to order. So I was standing there and I think maybe it was the walking or that, I don't know, going down the stairs. I don't know what it was. Suddenly I felt my first contraction back and this time it was really intense because I had to sit down I remember there was these tables right, and I sat and I told my husband I said okay they started back up again and I had to be like like breathe through it still very manageable but very different from what I had experienced that morning so they were a bit intense uh, I had to breathe through it and I told my husband I said okay I think we should go back up like because they're you know kind of building up and I think by that time I had eaten my sandwich it was not a very smart decision because I was so nauseous after that. And, I, you know, now I'm very this thing about those big meals. And I think, again, if I had someone like a doula, perhaps, I think I wouldn't have done that, right? Because this was my own decision being very naive about like, let's eat a, a dinner instead. I could have planned for perhaps smaller snacks or something that was more spaced out instead of like a dinner uh, yeah. meal. Because I was, I was nauseous when I went up and... Um, but by this time, the contractions actually had really come back quite strongly. Uh, and this was, I think, around seven o'clock. So that's why when you asked me, I said, that's really when my active labor started. Mm-hmm. Um, so by seven, they were really, really intense. And um, I think that was the part where I would have loved a doula for support. Because I think my husband and I, because we were first-time mm-hmm. parents, and it was so different from the morning. It suddenly threw me off. Now, now when I look back at it, I don't think it was, but I think because of how different it felt, I was suddenly like, what's happening? And once you go into that, like, what is happening? I think it's it spirals downward very quickly. So I felt there were moments when I felt I'm like, why is this so intense? Like, am I doing this right? I felt like whatever I had envisioned for, you know, the labor, I'm like, this is, not it like I don't think I was I Mm. felt like I wasn't coping well and um, what I ended up doing again which in my second birth I did did, for that reason it was so different I said I need to lie down because I was nauseous I wasn't feeling great so I went and I'm like I just wanted to like curl up Uh, I still laid on my side not on my back which is which was you know one up from that but I remember being in this like really comforting like fetal position and my husband was like massaging my back and uh, that is really when I entered that labor land you know where I didn't care about anything anymore I wasn't uh, really tuned in to the nurses and whatnot I was just very very focused on the labor so my goal at that time had become like how do I get through this one contraction like let me get through this one before the next one came because by then uh, they moved again, I think, quite quickly to that five minute gap, three minute gap very, very soon. So by around perhaps 8, 830, it was uh, quite there, but I had to really like work through this, really breathe through it and count and do all of that. Um, I think amazing that emerged out of this for my husband and I, this wasn't planned at all. So he started doing the the massage on my back, like with his fingers. It was really helping. So sometimes a nurse would do it, sometimes he would do it. And we developed this little like system because I wasn't talking by then. I didn't want to talk. I wanted to be really uh-huh. focused in work. So yeah. every time I would feel a surge coming, I said, do that. And he would do it. And then he would stop because I didn't want to be touched any other time. I only wanted that yeah. massage and I wanted to be left alone the rest of the time to just focus and kind of be ready for the next. That was so helpful. And I love that that sort of ritual. unspoken s- ritual, yeah. exactly, that had yeah. kind of emerged we, very spontaneously. Dude, yeah, and that's so beautiful. So all that we kind of teach is, it, it's just something that also comes to you instinctively. Yes, so we'll absolutely. Because ritual. we couldn't have planned that. I mean, we did practice it, but just that of like, start with the start and then stop I don't want to be touched for a second more after that and I remember being so sensitive to touch which was very interesting because I had visions of like you know my husband holding me and doing a lot of like very touchy feely things and in labor I was so heightened my sense of like not wanting to be touched except for that you know that massage I was very very specific about what I needed in that labor and 
Yeah. Yeah. So it would it was somewhere around 10 to 12 hours from the early labor to the active labor because it started in the night, right? Correct. It, it, no, it started that morning at five. So on paper, it's about 18 hours labor. But in mm. my mind, it's always those three hours at the end. So yeah. my baby was born by 1020 that night. So okay. from that subway Seven. incident of around 637, it was about three to four hours of. Sleep. And there weren't any internal examinations in this to kind of. So um, there were two. One was uh, by the hospital, one was actually requested by me. So an interesting story around that. So in my birth plan, I said, you know, I don't want vaginal exams because I've read all the research and all of that. And Dr. Paul was actually very supportive about it. But when I went in that morning, he was not around, right? He came in a bit later. So in that triage and kind of like getting me admitted into it and that sort of early stages, the head... Uh, midwife or the nurse came around and she said you know I need to check you once like we have to do it like it's just sort of like a thing I need to know where you're at like how do I know yeah. and I remember thinking oh but I didn't have that on my birth plan and I think again this is where we sort of go into this giving in or consenting mm-hmm. right because it's been asked and I didn't want to be a paid and I don't want to protest too much and I said okay maybe you know fine if it's they, they did say it's going to just be this one I don't need to keep checking you let me just do it mm-hmm. so that I know how how dilated you are and uh and, you know she checked the pad to see the color and whatnot to make sure mm-hmm. that it was what they needed it to be uh, but when this my labor had you know intensified and my doctor had come by I think around seven eight uh ish to do sort of and he just said hey everything okay like what's going on and I said yeah it's fine you know, da, da, da. and then I said, "Can you check me and tell me how far I've come?" Because at that point, I felt like I needed to know. And I remember him mm-hmm. saying, "Are you sure?" Because you know that's something you didn't want. And I, I appreciate that so much because he said, "You want this?" And I said, "Yes, please, just tell me how far I've come." Yeah, it was a bit of, a, I think, a gamble to ask that because could I have, you know, labored on not knowing that, or did I need to know that? But I just felt like I needed to know how much more I needed to work through. And when he said it was seven, I think it was a huge relief. I said, okay, this I can do. Like, it's just uh, the sort of the last home stretch right before we see baby. So very interestingly, he said, oh, he's seven centimeters. So you're going to call me in the middle of the night. I know this is going to be a 3 a.m. baby because he joked and he said, I have to come, you know, in the middle of the night. And I always look back and say, you see, it's so much experience, right? There's no way to predict that. Because yeah. he, that's his, uh, that was his estimate of, you know, that. And she was born at 10 20 that night because that's just Amazing. how much time she needed. So it was three more hours actually to the birth that none of us knew. Yeah, that's how it happened. So I did have two vaginal exams in total. Uh, but I think they were, for the most part, very respectful and they didn't have yeah. to do that. And they didn't have and a need to know as well about that. Definitely. That's, a, that's very good because. We do see this being forced upon women because the caregivers need to know. And for a doctor to come in and say, even around inactive labor, that I don't need to check you, I'm just fine. That just shows that he's ready to be here with you as a caregiver whenever it happens. He doesn't want to interfere. And that's right. That says a lot. That says a lot. And mothers do do ask for this checks. I was reading in Amigaskin's book and all those birth stories that Women do ask, and that's their yeah. choice, and that should definitely Absolutely. be respected. Absolutely, and I think it was respected, and I and at that time, like I said, maybe was I had that need to know. And how did um, this this last bit of transition feel like to you? Right, I think with both my labors, the transition was actually the the, the hardest part for me. It wasn't even active because my contractions started to come like back to back without a break so it was very short but I really had to work through it so a lot of it actually came back to mindset Uh, it was just like how do I keep going because it's so easy in that time to feel like I can't do this right I can't uh, go on like what do I need and I remember there was a very uh, there was a moment where I said maybe this is when I should ask for an epidural like I felt like I wasn't coping for me I felt like I wanted to do it uh, drug free that was my goal it was a personal mm-hmm. one um, without judgment anyone else who chooses differently but and even then I, I say this very honestly there was a point where I said should I like am I doing this okay like somehow it feels like I need something to take that edge off of it because it was getting so intense and this was a lot of internal dialogue because by right then I was not really you know chatting and talking because I was so focused and 
once the thought came to me, I said, no, there's a reason why I, I want to do this without that. And then we, the power of affirmations came in, which is why I'm such a huge fan. There's one that says, you know, every, because uh, that, that time I had done hypnobirthing, so every surge brings you closer to the baby. Uh, somehow that just came to me out of the blue, out of all the list of affirmations that, you know, you do oh. and you practice with. And I said, that's it. I'm just going to fix it on that. Like that is going to just take me to the next one. So I stopped, I think, looking ahead and I said, okay, let me get through this. Let me get through this. And I'm in awe of the power of mindset, I think, in that moment, because it was really that that changed it around. Because my body was still doing the same, you know, my the intensity was the same and none of that changed. But that very fact about that, 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 that affirmation came to me and I said, hmm, you know, that can be an interesting perspective to kind of hold on to uh took me through that last one hour because I really needed that and it was getting um quite intense like I said and I don't think I was calculating time right because we have that uh, what's the term for that the uh, I'm sure you know this the uh, into the labor the land uh, your neocortex right, right. is right yeah right. you have a you're not tuned in so I didn't know how long it was I didn't know how long I had been laboring and how long it but I just felt it was close enough like you know she was going to be here soon so it just took me through that as well i definitely love uh, the fact that you talked about the mind here because in one of the stories you uh, hear that in my gas i'm reading her so that's that's on top of my head yeah. so she's uh there's one story where she says that um and she's also a big fan like a midwife about the brain so there was once that she had to go somewhere and the mother was dilated to 10 and i think the mother didn't want her to go so she just became quiet after all that. She became quiet. She was very not um, happy or so. Or then her dilation, you know, she she went back to 50% dilated. Yeah. Back, reverse. In a Megaskin says she did it on purpose. It was her subconscious that did it. She didn't want me to go. And then I told her, look, I'm here. Just, just get back to yourself. And then she was dilated to back to 10. Mm. It just happened. And then the women yeah. and the sphincter law that she's like uh, brought up that your mind definitely has a role Absolutely. to play in your Absolutely. how you dilate it. Because yeah. that's why I said, you know, you can spiral down. It can happen both ways, right? But even when you, you can also say, oh, I can't do this anymore. And then it spirals downwards, even though you might be really close, you might be doing so great. Or the other way, if you can find something to uplift yourself you know that can take you through yeah. so i think it works very powerfully both ways which is why yeah i'm a huge advocate for like mindset work on yeah. for birth prep um, and surrendering sure. to the process which you did um when yes you did those affirmations. yes yes and in yeah i mean when we get to the second birth we, but the surrendering was so different in both because i felt like in the first one um I didn't feel as in, in the control that I wanted, I think, because it, it was mm. new. It was, you know, it was, I was experiencing it for the first time. So each one I had to learn how to cope and it was very, very fresh. Whereas with the second, I was like, okay, I know this is going to happen. Like, how can I uh, surrender much more intentionally? I think so. It was very powerful uh, the second time around because I had a very similar labor experience, but it was um, just felt much more uh, grounded if that's yeah. the word to use for that yeah. yeah about like if you were to speak about this last intense experience and talk about it in terms of pain how, how, how do you talk about it yeah oh that's so hard because i i can't compare it to anything um but for me you can't pinpoint it there's not one place that for me in transition everything else you know someone's massaging me it helps someone's doing something it helps but with transition it just feels everywhere and nowhere at the same time mm. it just like it just spreads and and it comes on so unexpectedly that there's almost like there's no touch that can help so usually with pain that's our coping you know you hurt your elbow and you're like rubbing it and feels better than you I didn't know enough in my first I think to switch because I was still trying to trying to breathe through it and it wasn't helping because you can't I, I think you can't breathe through transition like you know you have to be loud and powerful and 
and upright mm. and I wasn't doing that I was lying down like I told you because I was like curled okay. up in the bottom like okay. I need to just go through this yeah. and that's when I said I wish I had a doula that said hey if you want to get up and walk around with me you know like move around or just really open up and obviously my husband it was his first time so he had done the class with me I think he knew even less than me because he's obviously it's not his uh, wasn't his main uh, uh, it wasn't happening to him so between us I think we were just trying to be like how do we get through this, right? Whether it's with my second, because I knew this was going to happen. I think I was so much more in my own um, self. So, like I didn't, yeah. right? And I know those are such characteristics of that stage. So when, you th- when you're thinking that, it really yeah. means you're at the end. But in that yeah. moment, it's not very pleasant, especially if you don't know how to cope. Uh, and there are ways that you can learn to move through it. And in the program I teach, we speak about, you know, that one forbidden thing. So all of us have that one thing we say we will never do, right? And, you know, for people who want a natural birth, it could be taking the epidural. For someone who's very, very in control, it could be losing control, you know, being loud. Or it could be pooping in labor. I think that's a big one yeah. for people that says, I never, like, if I do that, what does that mean about me? And I think for me, it was the epidural because I was so... To me, that was my one forbidden thing. Is that I, I think the right support is very necessary in those moments because it didn't mean anything about me. It was just what I needed in that moment, yes. and that moment passed. And then you know, I found a way to cope. But I think for so long, I fixated on look at me. I asked for the, you know, I did this and I did that, and I've now so much more uh, appreciation of my own strength. I think I actually did the very best in that time with what I knew and what yes. I had, and you yes. know. Uh, yes. That takes me to this um, uh, this old ancient tradition I was reading about with women in labor as a community when the community is there. Towards the transition, they yeah. start singing, they start yeah. drumming, they yeah. start building up the energy so that the adrenaline Our, goes through the yeah. mother and they start yes. those, they're called spells. So in the ancient times, midwives were, they, they were yeah. called as witch, witches. Because they had those spells, those charms right, that they could right. use. So they used to use this. And this was primarily in births. They used to do it in mm-hmm, birth and all the women. Yeah. So they would do that. And that would just build up onto the mother. That momentum. Would... Yes. Absolutely. And thank you for sharing that. Because when I related to my second birth, that felt so right. Because like I said, I you know I couldn't be breathing calmly anymore. You know, There was no massaging and those gentle yeah. things happening. I really needed something powerful. And I think I found it with my second because I used my voice and I was holding and, and my midwife was talking me through that, which was so helpful. And I didn't have that the first time because yeah. I don't think there was a system to support it. It was kind of like, just figure it out on your own, like go through yeah. it. Like we're here. And I'm like, that's not what I need, right? I needed someone to do something. And I didn't know what that something was in that moment, I think, because I didn't know enough to help myself. My husband didn't. So you were vocal the second time around in the home birth? You were using... I was. I was voice. very, very vocal. Yes. A lot of yeah. like that deep sort of the birth sounds, right? A lot of downward, very guttural, very... Primal. Uh, thing. Yes. So instead of doing just the breathing, like quietly, yes, it was very primal, very instinctive. And again, by then I had taught so many birth classes. I had taught that. So I think it was just something that I went to right away. I will say with my second though, that there was a moment of that panic. And I remember telling my midwife, I don't want to feel that. Like, and I did feel it. Do you know when transition starts and it suddenly gets intense? I said, oh my gosh, nothing is helping now. You know, I didn't want to be touched again, actually, this time as well. It wasn't helping, even though they were trying it. I'm like, no, it's not. And I suddenly remembered, I said, I can use my voice. And I remember midwives saying, yes. And there was a sudden shift because I went really quiet, really inward. And then every time I had a contraction, I would like, like sound it out or like moan it out. And it was so powerful because that's what got me through. And the second time around, I had that skill. I had that knowledge and I had that sort of... Um, I don't know that very instinctive like listening to myself but as I think with the first time I was like what do I do next right what what mm. else can I do I've tried everything and I think you're also aware you know in a hospital and correct me if I'm wrong in a hospital you're also aware somewhere about your correct. environment exactly and how am I presenting that like, even in those very raw moments you're just like what will they think of me and is this appropriate to do what I'm too loud and and uh, like I said there wasn't that encouragement and so that's where I think it gets very interesting so it wasn't you know the the staff were lovely right they were like do you need this do you need that but 
that's not what I needed at that time. I just needed someone to hold my hand and say, you can do this, like, and look me in the eye. And I think at that time, we had, uh, you know, I had planned for the water birth. So it was on my birth plan. We had signed up for that package. That was obviously, you know, I'm saying more expensive because I think for the hospital staff, they had started prepping that tub from seven o'clock, right? Because they saw it, they're like, do you want to get into the water? Do you want to get into the water? I'm like, don't talk to me. And it was so interesting because I had all these visions of the water birth. And by the time I was in active labor transition, I was freezing. And I didn't know I was supposed to feel that. And I said, why am I so cold? And this is in Malaysia, it's tropical weather, it's hot. And, you know, uh, I, I made them turn the air con off. And I was like, I'm cold. And my husband had this like really thick cardigan. I don't know why. And I was like, oh, and I was so cold. And my husband said, what's going on? I said, I don't know. I am cold. And so every time the nurses would say, do you want to get into the water now? And I said, I don't want to think of water because it's cold and for that I need to take my clothes off and I wasn't feeling like that and so at some point um, while I was on the bed I suddenly felt this like this downward movement it was very different from anything I felt at that time and I just intuitively I again I hats off to that wisdom that I think we just have innately like, yeah. there's no one there's no way someone could explain this to me I was just like, that's it. That's her. Like, she's coming. And I was still on the bed and I said, I need to give birth in water. Like, that's what I decided. And I am going to do this. And I don't know what <laughs> possessed me to have that. I told my husband, I said, I need to get into the water now. You need to, yeah, you know, like, you know, walk with me. So I sat up and I'd been wearing a robe. And that robe just fell off. And I was like, I don't care. <laughs> like, I don't care how I look. I don't care that I'm like stark naked. And I was such a funny thing because, um, and I started walking to the tub, right? And this nurse ran behind me with the rope. And I was like, why? Like, I'm like, I don't want to wear that. And it was funny. So there must be like, this this person has got, like, she's really into it now. So the, it's a huge labor ward. And so the, not like the sweet, the, and it was about, I don't mean like huge, but it was quite spread out. So I had to walk from the bed to the tub. Like it was about 10, 10 to 15 steps, I think. And that was the longest walk of my life because by this I can tell now I was in transition because they came every second. Like I, I had I had to stop every second, you know, to, to cope, breathe. And I said, okay, let me go forward. So by the time I was eventually at the tub, like uh, I might have been really close because I felt that like that poopy feeling. And that's when I said, I was like, oh, I need to poop. And the nurse was like, no, you need to get into the tub. And I'm like, no, I need to go to the toilet. So it was very funny. And I think at that time they got really firm. And I know nurses do this when they want mm -hmm. you to comply. Mm -hmm. And I hated that. I hated being talked to like that. And up until then, it was so nice. She said, like, no, you need to get into the tub now. Uh -huh. And that makes you listen, right? Because yes. you're like, yeah. Yeah. I don't have a choice. And um, it's a beautiful tub, right? It's about a couple of feet high. And there's this little wooden ladder that you have to climb to get in and I silently thought I'm like I don't know who designed this <laughs> but they have never given birth before because <laughs> why are you making me climb up and can you imagine I was in transition and I had to climb up like two two or three of this like little wooden ladder to get in and it mm -hmm. was it was funny because I'm like I can't do this and I had all these people helping me and I got into the tub and I was like this is so good I mean so so good it was just like the biggest relief and I instantly relaxed like I could feel my body like up until then I was holding myself really tightly because um I was trying to cope and I sat in the tub and I got that little bit of a break I think because of the water or just that instant relaxation because the water was just nice and warm and they had done such a wonderful job of keeping it at the right temperature I hadn't used it for two hours or something and I think they were like yeah. feverishly working at making it just right so I'm so thankful for that and I got in and I I remember thinking, I wish I had done this earlier. And again, this is why I said it was so important to have had someone who could have guided me. Right? And if I had had a doula, I think that would have been the first suggestion is, do you want yeah. to just try, you know, just get in there and, and do it because it might feel uh, good. And I know the nurses were asking the same thing, but it wasn't the could same have, thing, if yeah. that makes sense. And I didn't know them and it was more of a, we have it ready, That's we want to true. try it now. And I yeah. sat down, it was so relaxing. And then I had another contraction while I was in the water and I said, oh, this is so much more doable. It's so much more manageable. And then I had another one and she was out. 
So that's mm. the end of my first story. Because there was no pushing stage, right? It was so close. And with the second one, it's like my body just sent her out. I had actually no uh, active pushing involved. And she yeah. just came into the water very, very quickly. Um, and I think because she came in so quickly, this is one of the most beautiful parts of it, is that I received her because there was no one around me at the, in that moment. Because I think they were expecting a little bit longer. So, you know, everyone was, um, it just happened that way that I got to hold her first and, you know, bring her up uh, to my, not fully to myself, but at least hold her as she came in. So it was yeah. really nice. And that is the, yeah, and it just was supersonic speed at the end. I feel like very, very fast. Uh, and um, yeah, I didn't have to push push actively yeah, at all important, because it was so ready. Very important that you bring it up because okay. we do say that um, the body just pushes the baby out. You need to receive Absolutely. it. In my case, it definitely did. Yeah, yeah. a lot of mothers. So yeah, I think then around. So this is me also putting my opinion or what I'm thinking right now out there. Different for different people, definitely, but. Um, when mothers are into themselves, like uh -huh. you were into yourself, uh, and you were just like to hell with everything. This is this is who right. I am, and then absolutely. the body just does its work because the body is right. absolutely relaxed. So water also did that yes. to you. Yes, absolutely. I think it was the right thing at that time, and it's also a lesson in like trying something new, just moving. I think maybe the walk itself was very helpful, yeah. just being upright and all of that. So yeah, and then also you you felt everything so we say all your body gets the surge that's what we say right? uh no i didn't mean i didn't mean all over the place that it was all over my body but in even in my back there wasn't one point that i could uh, that's just it's very hard for me to describe transition for me it's the closest would be a period cramp like that's but the thing is it goes away so that's that's a good thing it comes and it goes so there's always that break to look forward to after that yeah, but yeah it's very hard to describe <laughs> <laughs> it's good that we're talking about the fact that it's hard to describe you'll just feel yeah. it it will it just is. come it is. And it's definitely not pain though i wouldn't call it pain and that's yeah very I, that was it was question. not painful yeah no it, it was, was just intense. uncomfortable yes it's very uncomfortable to stay with but it's not pain in the same sense of what we think of pain as when we have, we're injured or we're ill it's not that yeah, I'm happy you answered that. <laughs> and how did you feel right after? So she was in your hands, and maybe let's just yes. go to that moment in yeah. your hands. You just got her instinctively, and then okay. how did you feel? I'll be very honest. Okay, I it took me a while to connect with her because I just went through this thing, and I was like, "Oh my gosh!" Like I held her right because they gave her to me right away. And I think my my doctor actually wasn't um, right because, like I said, they weren't there. And so it all it was a sudden bustle of activity in that first few seconds. And he said, "Oh, you did so well. This is I remember him saying this is a textbook water birth." And I looked at him. I'm like, I couldn't care less. Like I am just <laughs> like I just went through this right. And he was saying, "Everyone was like, oh, congratulations." And I remember still being so detached from all of that excitement because, you know, the baby was here and there was all of this activity and my husband was like, oh, what? And I think I needed that moment to just get my bearings back just to kind of be like, wow, what just happened? Like, oh my gosh, like I just did this. And it took me a while to connect with her, that she was on my um, chest and she was there. I mean, and I don't mean this in a, in a way where I didn't, realize that but I also talk about this because I know there's this expectation of this like sudden surge of love and we we talk about that but it because yeah. I also felt like it was slightly a bit of an outer body experience because it was so intense and that's not who I was and right? all of the stuff I had done prior to that was not stuff I normally did was like being loud or um not feeling great or or uh, doing that mindset work I had to do or feel like I wasn't doing great and then coming back from that so I think it was just a whole lot of stuff packed into an hour and you need a bit of time to just say wow I'm grateful for that experience because I have never been that liberated from those layers like to me that's wow. my most 
powerful thing that I actually didn't care about what I said or how I looked or how loud. And that naked thing, I mean, I never, you know, like yeah, so you spoke uh, about it, about your breast modesty. also. You exactly. Not very comfortable, yeah. So. Exactly. I don't do that. And I'm okay with it because that's yeah, sort so. of my boundary. But I have never, and so to be that liberated where those layers of conditioning are just stripped off, where you don't care about what you're saying and how you say it, because I watch my stuff so much and and I think for me, that's the biggest gift that labor has given me is to that experience of being that raw and that, um, yeah, that naked in a way, right? With all those yeah. layers stripped away. So, bear, yeah, absolutely and, bear. Yeah, and this reminds me of Vapio's, um, Vapio has a YouTube channel. She's, she's a seasoned midwife and she mm-hmm. has this course in Dula and she's amazing. She's Tapasa did her um study with her and she's just fantastic right. so i was going through it when in one, in one of the videos she says that mothers uh right after they've given birth so every mother is different so sometimes she doesn't even pick up like she's if she's got her baby she'll put put the baby down and then she'll still be in her head somewhere and she would not may not feel like picking up the baby that is how I would describe it because I was not connected like I said I I needed that moment and it was with both my births in fact with my second birth it was even more different because I told my midwife I said can you pick her up I can't I mean pick him up I cannot and and I think I was much more assertive with the second one I said I can't can you pick him up and pass him to me because I need that one second to to refocus and become the mother right I in that moment I was not yet and I think that's really yeah Thank you for doing this because I never reflected on that until this moment about how that was. And I think that's that's what it was. I I needed a moment to become a mother before I pass through that phase of uh, motherhood. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. Gave me goosebumps the moment you said made into motherhood because that's the hardest transition. And it is. with every it birth, is. baby. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think it's it's so um interesting that it's not instantaneous and that's okay right because there is that sort of uh, what we call in birthing from within the the death of the maiden so you're no longer that single person that you were in that moment and I think uh, it's interesting that I was able to honor that in a way very unintentionally even with my second I wasn't very conscious of it but I was able to honor that and say I am not yet a mother like I need that minute to myself before I take it on because once I took it on, I can never again be that person, right? It's always now about them. It's so attuned, so much of that. So I can, in that moment, I was, I was not yet connected. And I'm very thankful for that. And I'm very grateful to you for being able to, you know, help me reflect on that because I actually never did that until now. So that was what was happening. Yeah. I hope this helped you get a bird's eye view of what labor and birth can look like. Know that it is always different for different people. In part two of this episode, we will go through Namrita's second birth experience, a home birth with a midwife. Thank you for listening. There is a field beyond fear where the body is empowered to take on labor and birth. To land there, it is crucial to take birth education. To enroll into our unique labor and birth preparation course, reach out to us at www.birthagni.com or scroll through all available prenatal and postnatal preparation classes. Thank you for listening. All in the spirit of birth, womanhood and freedom. Remember, you got the bar. This podcast is about physiological birth and does not offer or claim to provide medical knowledge or diagnosis.